the definition of criminal property in the cannabis industry and cross-jurisdictional barriers, the European patchwork approach to regulation, an examination of the European landscape, market trends, barriers to investment, and the lack of legal harmonization. The presentation will examine novel foods, the differences between the UK, the EU, and look at individual jurisdictions creating their own industries. Attendees will be able to ask questions and drive topics with Europe's premier cannabis consultancy. No questions are out of bounds. Co-founder of the Canna Consultants from the United Kingdom, Stephen Oliver. Co-founder of the Canna Consultants from the United Kingdom, Matthew Lawson. to those of you in Asia, good morning to those of you in Europe, uh, and good very early morning to any of you from the Americas. Uh, for the next 40 minutes or so, you're going to hear from myself, Matt Lawson, and my co-founder of the Canna Consultant, Stephen Oliver, uh, about the position of cannabis-based products in both the UK, Europe, and depending on what questions we have, in other parts of the world as well. Uh, the Canna Consultants is a dedicated cannabinoid consultancy based in the UK, but we provide advice to corporations and governments as well throughout the whole world. The uh, purpose of today's uh, discussions with you, we've been asked to speak about the proceeds of crime uh, regulations and law in the United Kingdom, and then generally more wider on what's essentially a patchwork of uh, legislation, rules and regulations in different jurisdictions, both in the UK, that will now be a, an, in, a separate entity following the Brexit period, uh, Europe, and then again, wider elements of the world um, itself. So I'll hand over now to Steve, the co-founder of the Canna Consultants. Steve's going to address the first element of that to do with the proceeds of crime, then we'll move into the patchwork of reg regulation uh, and there'll be opportunity either during the course of this or at the conclusion to ask any questions that any of you may have. And um, we don't script these matters and the more questions the better because it's important that we feel that given that you are from such disparate parts of the world with such disparate interests in the cannabinoid sphere, that all questions can get answered as much as possible. So welcome, and I'll now hand over to Steve, who will deal with the proceeds of crime and the financial implications of investment and conduct in the cannabinoid business. Good afternoon. So howdy, everybody. We're not quite as disparate from each other as we think, because Matt and I have quite a tall order here. We're going to attempt to talk about the continent of Europe. Um, the continent of Europe comprises of 51 independent states, some of which are in the West Asian territory. Um, so we do have a foot across the oceans. So countries like Georgia, Azerbaijan, Turkey, Kazakhstan are West Asian. We then have within that 51 countries, 27 countries who form the European Union. And you would imagine the European Union would have harmonised laws. But when it comes to cannabis, as we'll explain a little bit more later, you'll find that there is a disparity in laws across that union. The latest country to join that union is Croatia and I'm sure everybody here will be fully aware that the first and only country to leave that union is the United Kingdom and that in itself has caused a number of inherent problems. So we have a wide breadth of countries, wide breadth of jurisdictions, wide breadth of laws to cover and we encourage you because we won't be able to talk about all of them to come forward with you with your questions. So the starting point, I suppose, really is with such a wide breadth of countries, we're looking at investment opportunities, which will bring us on to pocket. So what are the investment opportunities? Well, they're huge, they're manifest. Anybody's figures that we read will show that in Europe, the cannabis uh, industry as a whole is set to breach 2, 3, 4, 15 or so by some reports million in the next five years. But there are barriers. There are also immense opportunities. And the barriers we see to be fourfold. So the first of that is there's a lack of harmonization of legislation. So from one state to another, the laws apropos medicinal cannabis, pharmaceutical products, recreational products, supplemental products and food are disparate. The second issue, I think, is a lack of mistrust from medical professions. So the use of cannabinoids for medicinal purposes is a relatively new 
certainly in the Western Hemisphere. Whilst we can date this back thousands of years, the use in traditional medicines, but now mainstream medicines and prescriptions, it's a relatively new and uneducated from the medical profession. That is, that is changing. The third, I think, is a lack of funding. <clears throat> so traditionally, we've seen pharmaceutical companies such as GW Pharmaceuticals, who are responsible for two authorised drugs. And R&D in the traditional industries has not been forthcoming in the cannabis industry, but that's changing. And I think the fourth barrier is the responsibility of companies themselves, who have spread misinformation and often made claims which are maybe honestly believed, but not founded. So they're the main barriers, but I think the main barrier there is the first one where we talked about a lack of harmonization of laws. So what do you mean? Well, we've all seen <clears throat> in the last three, four, five years, the explosion in North America of recreational and legalization of cannabis. And a desire from many businesses and individuals across the globe to invest. One of the main barriers for investment into that market has been from the United Kingdom and Europe from their money laundering regulations. And we talk about the definition of criminal property. So what is criminal property? Well, the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002 in the United Kingdom defines it as property from which a person has directly or indirectly benefited from criminal conduct. So we can see that in the UK, the possession and the supply of cannabis is a criminal offence. But in Canada and in certain states in North America, it's not. The law states that if I was to invest in a lawful business in North America, I could be considered by the European and, and many European states to have invested and benefited from criminal property. Now, the law has developed and the law has attempted to provide us with defences. One of the most famous defences is called the bullfighter defence. And it's an example which easily describes what we're looking at here. So we have somebody who's conducting lawful or until recently in a number of Spanish states, lawful activity of being a bullfighter. And then the matador travels to London to spend his legal wages. That, with regard to investors, was meant to provide a defence, an automatic defence, if they were investing in a jurisdiction where the activity was lawful. And even if it was a criminal offence in the United Kingdom, providing it didn't result in the maximum penalty of 12 months imprisonment, that would be defence. Unfortunately for cannabis in the United Kingdom, in many European states, those sentences are potentially much greater. In the United Kingdom, for example, possession can result in a prison custodial sentence of up to five years, and supply can result in a sentence of up to 14 years. So that defence doesn't apply. So we then sought to have an additional level of defence, which were called the suspicious activity reports, or we were looking at a situation where you could actually go forward and report to the activities ahead of making an investment and ask for clarity. The situation has changed fundamentally in recent years with the emergence of legal medicinal marijuana. So we have medicines now which are lawfully prescribed. And in 2017, we saw the Germans legalise some medicinal preparations. We saw the UK government follow suit in 2018. So investments now are possible in companies who are involved in the preparation and the distribution of medicinal cannabis products. But it's important to distinguish between what actually is a medicinal cannabis product. On the one hand, we have the pharmaceutical pro products, which I touched upon, such as Sativex and Epidil X, which are manufactured by GW Pharmaceuticals. They are authorized medicines, which have been through a number of years of clinical trials. But we also have widespread use of full plant cannabis medicines, which are lawful in some states and not another. So an investor needs to be exceptionally careful when looking at the conduct of a business, because we may find that we're investing in a company that for all intents and purposes, our investment is directed towards the lawful medicinal use of cannabis. But as we see a lot across North America and in many other areas of the globe, those companies are spreading their investments. So a company may well be involved in lawful activity uh, as deemed by a European country, but unlawful activity because part of their investment, part of their structure, part of their commercial activity may well be in the recreational arena. So the lack of harmonization still presents a problem, but that's changing. And the temptation here is to jump before we really look at where we are placing our money. Because even 
dividends from shareholders could be deemed as criminal property. That said, on a very positive note, we're yet to see any prosecutions. So none of these, none of these acts or investments have been the subject of any judicial proceedings. But that has a downside because we haven't had the opportunity to actually define or to see how the law would be applied. So that's an overview, a very brief overview of the definition of criminal property, how the law's evolving, and it's undergoing various reviews at the moment. We've seen the, our stock exchange here advising that uh, we will see companies for the first time on the stock exchange. They won't be recreational companies, but they will be medicinal investment companies, and that presents a huge opportunity. I think it's probably important now to try and focus. So with regard to your questions, we welcome them. We're going to try and focus on the UK, the European Union, and some of the, some of the events that are taking place at the moment and look at them in a little bit more detail. So before okay. we move on, I know you wanted us to interject with questions for your uh, presentation. Uh, before you move on to the next topic, uh, the audience has a question about the criminality that you were discussing. Um, so for example, if you want to elaborate, um, to make sure that we have an accurate understanding. You're saying that a UK citizen basically cannot or can be found criminally guilt or criminalized for investing in maybe a Colorado cannabis uh, endeavor, where in, in Colorado and the United States where it's legal, uh, if they're investing as a UK citizen, can they can be criminalized for that? Yes, so the, the UK position is quite clear that whilst there is, a, that there is an inherent defense that, that if conduct in the state where the investment is placed is criminal, considered to be criminal conduct in the UK, the issue here is how serious would the UK government consider that criminal offense to be? So to, to be quite clear, for, for, for offenses which carry a minimum of, a, sorry, a maximum of 12 months imprisonment, anything below that would be subject to this defence. But when we're talking about cannabis in the United Kingdom, off uh, offences for the possession and for the supply of cannabis at the most serious end of the scale can result in five or 14 years imprisonment respectively. So therefore there would be no defence with regard to the Proceeds of Crime Act and an investment which resulted in the receipt of money, the receipt of shares of dividends could be deemed as being handling criminal property. Now, to reiterate, as we stand now, we have yet to see any prosecution taken. It's certainly something that the government is not enforcing, but it is an absolute barrier for some large companies because it presents them with a huge reputational and operational risk. And the cannabis sector is still seen as a high risk investment strategy. But we must make the distinction between recreational investment in a state where that's lawful and investment into cannabis-based medicinal products and pharmaceutical companies operating in the medical arena. But we should caveat that by saying it's very important to look at the company's overall activities, because if one arm of the company is, in, is involved in recreational use in a state where it's lawful and other areas of its operations are in medicinal, which would be lawful in the United Kingdom, that investment could be deemed to be towards the whole company. And just to interject on the timing, it's upon the repatriation of funds to the jurisdiction in which the conduct would have been unlawful. So while the funds remain in the US, then no offence is created. But upon repatriation of the funds back to the investor, they then are deemed by the UK to be the, potentially deemed by the UK, to be the proceeds of crime for the reasons that Steve has outlined. Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. Please carry on. I know the time because it's we're moving on to 20 to the hour. So um, should we proceed, Steve? Yeah, absolutely, Matt. So um, I think we've covered that. I think it's time to look at the uh, European patchwork of private reg regulation. Yeah, um, perhaps a good place to start for this is because it's a, a microcosm and a manifestation of how different countries interpret it, interpret the same provisions. There is an issue in Europe now in relation to extracts and tinctures of cannabis and different countries take different views. And this matter stems from the definition of cannabis in the UN 1961 Convention on Narcotics, because in that uh, convention, 
cannabis is defined as including extracts and tinctures of cannabis. Now, the way this manifests itself is that there was a court, the court case uh, before the European court where there has been a preliminary judgment in the summer and the final judgment will be announced at the moment scheduled to be for the 19th of November. And if we took, we took, call that the Canavape case, we, we don't need to go into the facts of it. But in essence, what the issue there is, is that the French government interpreting the 1961 convention in a strict way, whereby an extract or tincture of cannabis is a narcotic. The French government imposes a law whereby they say any product which contains any extract or tincture is a narcotic. They don't look at CBN or THC or what one might control, call the generally regarded as controlled cannabinoids. They apply strict interpretation. Now, when one goes back to 1961, when the um, convention was drafted and the definition provided, it's pretty much inevitable that any extract or tincture that was made back at that time included controlled cannabinoids, in included narcotics. But as we all know, that's now not the case. With the isolation of cannab cannabinoids, one can have a situation whereby the controlled cannabinoids are removed and one can make a product with uncontrolled cannabinoids. But the French government interpreted it strictly. The different member states within the European Union where the products were produced uh, interpreted it in a more, um, more interpretive fashion of saying to themselves, well, what was intended to be controlled were the controlled cannabinoids. If a product doesn't have them in, then we are happy that that product is not a controlled narcotic. So product manufactured in one country transiting to for sale in France the French government said, no, these are narcotics. The uh, Advocate General of the European Commission uh, gave a preliminary ruling where the essence of which is that no, uh, that within the member states, if it was legal in one country, it should be legal in another country. And if the um, full court follows that uh, ruling, which it is likely to do, then it would have the, uh, the impact that the French law is incompatible with European law. We saw shortly after the publication of the uh, interim decision, the consequences of what then happens, because uh, many of you will be aware that in the European Union, uh, CBD has been designated as a novel food. So designated as a novel food, which means that there's a certain process that must, that the that, that products uh, to be brought to the market must go through prior to coming to the market. They must go through rigorous safety testing to evidence that they are safe for human consumption. Now, prior to the preliminary judgment in the cannabate case, uh, CBD products were being assessed as a food as part of that novel food process by the European Union. But what happened thereafter is that the European Union suspended all assessments of CBD products. Again, CBD, no one is, is not a controlled narcotic, but CBD is an extract of cannabis. And therefore, the French uh, were successful in petitioning the European Commission to say, well, we cannot be regulating this as a food in circumstances whereby uh, we say, and, and a reading of the, a strict reading of the 61 convention says that this is a narcotic. And therefore, uh, assessment of, of CBD as a food supplement in Europe has been suspended uh, and is not to progress until the EU Commission and the member states uh, have considered the matter further. Again, a patchwork because the UK, which is currently in the transition period, leaving the European Union, but still subject to some of the same rules and regulations at the present time, has broken away from that position. They have taken a more purposive in interpretation 
of the 1961 convention, as indeed have many other states. For example, taking a classic example, Canada is a signatory to that same convention, and yet they have the legalization of um, cannabis and cannabis products. So in the UK, the current position is, is that novel food applications for naturally derived CBD are progressing and there is a structure that's been put in place by the Food Standards Agency in the UK, whereby if companies um, who manufacture and sell uh, CBD products can uh, achieve a certain level of scientific and product accreditation, what we call validation, by the 31st of March of next year, then they can continue to remain on the market. So for just rolling back the, the clock a little, um, in the early part of this year, there was a situation whereby a manufacturer of a CBD product had the ability to sell in different jurisdictions. Uh, now that has been removed, certainly as far as the European Union is concerned, and CBD products within the member states of that union. Again, we have the, the typical situation that not every member state, even within that union, is policing the issue to the same extent. Nobody is going to suggest to you that you can't walk down high streets in capital cities all over Europe and find um, retailers who are selling CBD products, but they're all doing so in contravention of the law with the potential consequences in those jurisdictions. And again, it's a, a prime example of how one cannot have a one size fits all approach to the cannabis um, sector across jurisdictional borders. Each country has a different interpretation of the same law uh, and the consequences can be markedly different. In respect of the 61 convention and the interpretations of that, there is due to be a further vote in December of this year about amending some of the definitions. And if those, if the proposals were carried as they are currently drafted, then that would alleviate many of these issues. But that vote has been delayed um, previously on earlier occasions. It's been scheduled twice before, and um, it could get delayed again. However, even if it goes ahead from our contacts um, involved in the administration of the matter, we are led to believe that, that the elements of the proposals that would make a real difference to making the regulatory and legislative approach to cannabis and CBD products in general um, more, more simplified and easier uh, are unlikely to pass. Excellent. Can I touch on that really quick before we uh, make a segue to your next topic? Yeah. Great. So we were wondering what the economic environment in regards to investing into cannabis was currently. And it sounds like you answered my question partially in that the parliament is already uh, considering, unless it gets postponed, considering making some amendments, which if they pass can significantly impact and improve the likelihood of investment and proliferation, correct? I think it's more complicated than that. Um, sure. Yeah, so um, we need to we need to split the industry into into three. So we need to look at <clears throat> the food supplement industry. And Matt's talking about extractions, where the there is an absence of control cannabinoids, and we're looking at isolated products, so CBD. We then have a second element of the industry where we're looking at medicinal products, and that needs to be further split between pharmaceutical products and cannabis-based medicinal products. And then we have the third element, which is recreation. So to just further cloud the issue and show the lack of harmonisation. Luxembourg has declared their parliament that by the end of their term in 2024, they will be legalizing the use of cannabis. We expect a number of other European states, potentially Poland and some southern European states such as France and Portugal, to either legalize or decriminalize. Decriminalization doesn't help um, investors because it's no, there's no clarity. With regard to parliament, we've got competing issues happening here. So the, the case in the European courts that Matt's talking about will resolve the issue of the movement of goods and the fact that it's not actually the source of the material, because the issue here is it, if it comes, if it's derived from a narcotic, so we're looking at the whole plant, the flowers and the buds, there has to be a, dis, a disconnect between the source of the biomass and the product that we end up with. So during the processing procedure, if we remove the control cannabinoids and end up with a purified distillate 
or a broad spectrum, an oil or an isolate, which has an absence of controlled cannab cannabinoids, then that product would be lawful. But at the moment, we have a number of jurisdictions trying to find a way to, to, to create the legislation required. And it's further complicated by the fact that in the European Union, we have contaminant levels of controlled cannabinoids, so THC and CBN, in milk. Because some of our hemp farmers have fed, and quite lawfully, and um, animal welfare, dairy cattle have been fed hemp as part of their diet. And that means that into the food chain, in milk and in other areas, we have controlled cannabinoids. We also have limits on the seeds that can be used for cultivation. So we have a maximum of 0.2% THC in a strain in the field. That's recently been decided within Europe to be raised to 0.3. It hasn't in the UK. And in the UK, you're not allowed to utilize the flowers and, and budding tops of the female plant for extraction. You can use that in certain European states. So to answer your question simply, there is no clarity at the moment. And there is a lot of investment sought and there is a lot of investment being made, but it's at some risk because we will probably see a disparity between the way CBD products are treated in the United Kingdom and the way they're treated in Europe. The European Commission at the moment seems to favour synthetic extracts. Sorry, Matt. No, as I think, um, the, the, the best way to approach it from any, any investor or any business is to clearly define and understand the market that you are seeking to address. The problems really come was when, where, is where we have an evolution of a company, whereby, let's say it starts off supplying in one of the fields that Steve has identified, but then moves and branches out into another. So just taking it at its simplest level, uh, a food business that uses extracted and isolated cannabinoids in its products. Um, if that it were to expand into the cultivation of cannabis to supply it to in, in jurisdictions where it is lawful for the recreational use of cannabis, that expansion can significantly complicate the regulatory field and the liability of both the directors and the members and the shareholders. So um, if there are clear vertical chains of, of business that a company is invested in uh, and there's no crossover to an adjacent um, environment, then that makes it clearer. But where it gets very complicated is where we have um, cross-jurisdictional and cross-cannabis um, type businesses whereby they're involved in the recreational supply in one jurisdiction, they're involved in food in another, and medicines in another. That's where um, there is, there's the most um, opportunity for regulatory breach, not through intention, but just simply because the rules that apply in one jurisdiction to one product don't apply in another, and the same rules within the same jurisdiction don't apply, despite the fact that one might be handling what's essentially considered to be the same originating source material, and it's being deployed in different directions in terms of the end product. But with that, the, the greatest risk also offers the greatest opportunity. And a lot of our work involves, I suppose, directing people around the various legislative barriers that, that exist and overcoming those hurdles. But it also, different jurisdictions are, taking, are making opportunities out of this. Um, Steve and I have recently drafted uh, the entire regulatory and licensing structure for uh, an offshore island that sits in the Irish Sea called the Isle of Man. Um, it is an independent, what's called an independent crown dependency, in that it has the ability to make all of its own laws. Uh, it shares some laws with the UK if it wishes to do so, but it is entirely independent. It's not part of the European Union. And the structure that we've designed for them, which is currently out for consultation, so anybody can pass comment or uh, is being invited for their views on the matter, that the Isle of Man, as a jurisdiction, is looking to produce a harmonised situation for itself, but also for clarity for, for market participants as to what is or is not lawful within its jurisdiction and structuring it in such a way as to make it easier and clearer for any market participant 
to be able to dovetail its conduct within that on island jurisdiction and the sales of products thereafter with its own national laws so one can see a situation where they when where there is a jurisdiction which is trying to assist market participants and because it is starting afresh at a later point in time ensure that there is fully joined up thinking as to how that it is to structure its cannabinoid business and therefore seek to provide benefit and utility to anybody wishing to utilize its services because they are they are intending to allow cultivation extraction and processing of high thc to be manufactured and exported to legal jurisdictions for each category of product uh, and that way it's intending to make matters clearer and more more streamlined um, for people so that they compare what they do there with what the laws are in their own jurisdiction and know that the Isle of Man as, a, as an entity and as a location is not to interfere um, in the way that they deal with that matter. Excellent, thank you so much for that explanation. Uh, so we've got 10 minutes left for you gentlemen and I saw uh, on your slides, you still have some material to cover. So if you just wanna power through that, we won't interrupt you with any more uh, audience questions and we can pick back up with the uh, discussion panel later. So go ahead, please. Okay, and we're more than happy to field questions. What's most important here is that people with questions um, receive their answers. So if you have any, please, please fire away. I think, I think what Matt was alluding to there with the work that we've done on the Isle of Man, it's not the first jurisdiction to attempt to go it alone, but one of the most important things is that we have a patchwork of regulations. So we have, we have a number of different jurisdictions attempting to find a path through what is essentially a very, very complicated area for, for investors, for market participants, and for individuals. So we have individuals in Europe that want to want to receive medicinal... Okay, medicinal sorry to interrupt. We've actually got a really important question that will... Uh... Great. That'll actually be here's here's the here's the question I'll frame it for you because it touches back on um, the strict situation in UK, uh, which is in stark contrast to many of the EU countries, for instance, uh, Luxembourg, for example. So what the audience wants to know, the question is basically asking, um, do you think that Luxembourg or I'm sorry, what was the other country you mentioned? Poland. Do you think their um, amendments and changes in the regulations and legalization are going to have any influence on the UK? I think that it's very important to distinguish between recreational use and medicinal and supplemental use. Different states have varying attitudes to this. So we've seen since 1976, I believe, the Netherlands allowing the possession of small amounts of cannabis to, to, to be decriminalized. And we've seen the cafe culture there. That didn't result in other states following suit. In fact, it was some 20 years later when Portugal and Spain started to look to, to essentially decriminalization by stealth, where you would have the authorities intentionally not um, enforcing these regulations. Switzerland, for example, allows the outdoor, the cultivation of hemp with a 1% THC content. Should Luxembourg um, proceed with their legislation? They're coming from this from a position where they have a, they have recreational they, they have drug problems i'm not saying these are necessarily in relation to cannabis but the, their position would be that they have um harder drug issues and they see this as being a drugs policy uh, as opposed to the failed or the, or the often viewed as failed war on drugs they say this is more pr progressive way of of separating harder drugs from what are deemed as softer drugs that's not that's not in any way to diminish some of the very high strength TAC um, strains that we see on the market now. So no, I don't, I don't think that the British government will be led with regard to recreation. I certainly don't think the French will, but we, we, we will see a situation in Europe where some legalize it and some have a more relaxed attitude to individual use. I do not think for a moment that will extend to the, the supply um, of recreational cannabis. But it's very clear to distinguish between what the UK is doing, which is very proactive with regard to treating extractions from the cannabis plant, such as CBD in an isolated state, as being lawful. But again, we've got competing issues here because CBD itself has not been shown to be safe. We know from the GW work that they, and the trials that they conducted that in high doses, there are adverse reactions. 
uh, not going into those now, but the, but the balancing act there is, in a, in a medicinal environment, you have the pros and the cons. So if you are treating epilepsy in, in, in children, stopping them fitting can be offset with some of the more unpleasant adverse reactions. That set of criteria doesn't transfer across to food. Food must be regarded as safe. So what we're looking at here is trying to find what, the, what a safe daily dosage would be. And there again, there are differing opinions. And the same extends to all of the other cannabinoids, because now people are, are looking for, you know, cannabinoids, they're looking for CBG, and there are trends. And, and the market, as often with the law, the law is trying to react. So as Matt talked to you earlier, you know, these cannabis laws were enacted when nobody thought you could, you could isolate elements of the plant. They certainly didn't know what the plant were comprised of. So we're playing catch up and it's very difficult to create laws when the cannabis industry is racing ahead or accelerating. Great. Yeah, definitely. Uh, laws and regulation across the world are trying to, are finding themselves trying to catch up to the uh, fast paced cannabis industry. Definitely. Uh, one more question is regarding the mention of novel foods and more importantly, uh, they want to know what the situation is with CBD in general in the UK. Can somebody obtain it for personal use? Can they, do they import it? Is it smuggling? Is it illegal? What's going on with CBD specifically? Uh, CBD in the UK is not a controlled substance and therefore um, it is not regulated under the drugs laws. Um, however, one must be very clear that the product that many people um, seek to obtain or import if it contains controlled cannabinoids, so in the UK that's THC and CBN, then that product is a controlled substance. So where we see different jurisdictions having full spectrum products, full spectrum products that contain CBD inevitably by their nature contain controlled cannabinoids and would be unlawful in the United Kingdom. If we move to broad spectrum products, again, in principle, if the controlled cannabinoids have been removed, then they also would not be regulated as controlled drugs. They would be regulated as a novel food and the same as isolate CBD in a product regulated as a novel food, but not as a controlled drug. It's part of the problem or the issue in the UK that different government departments have different um, uh, authority depending on what a product is. So as okay. a as a food, CBD <coughs> is regulated by the Food Standards Agency uh, as a novel food, which defines a certain set of criteria that must be applied to it and processes it and assessments that it must go through. But in terms of its legality, a CBD or any cannabinoid product that has had the controlled cannabinoids, THC and CBN removed, would not be regulated as a narcotic and it is positively regulated as a food. Yeah. That's terrific to know that CBD is uh, not an issue in, in the UK. Uh, for our last it, three it, minutes. We might... it's, sorry, it, it is an issue because of novel foods. So the distinction is, can you, can you create a product which is not considered by the authorities to be a narcotic? Then if it's not a narcotic, it can be a food. You then have to prove the efficacy and the safety of the product. The positive is the CBD market in the UK is the largest in Europe by a number of estimates in, in the last year, it exceeded 500 million pounds and it's expected to grow year on year by up to 10 points. Okay, great. So the last question for these last couple of minutes, we wanna extrapolate on these complications in the UK and see how that uh, will, uh, can potentially lead to any uh, commercial or medical um, developments between Asia and UK in regards to cannabis. Do you guys see anything yeah. developing in the future? We already have a, a massive crossover. So I think that, you know, the Chinese market, the investment there, and we've seen recently last week, you know, a, a you know, 50 million pound investment in cultivation. The extraction, the CBD market is, accounts for, you know, some 50% of the market. We've got um, ISO suppliers for the UK product suppliers that are very successful in Japan and, and, are, and are making a lot of exports there and into Australia. So we're seeing a big crossover at the moment. There's an inherent, um, I suppose, rightly or wrongly, that there is a suspicion from both sides as to the quality of the products. But we are seeing com companies from the UK now exceptionally interested in entering the Asian markets and vice versa. Um, companies in Asia should, should see the 
the UK is an exciting uh, area for investment. I don't know what you think, Matt. Yeah, returning to a, one of the questions earlier, there is an inherent contradiction in some of the approaches in the UK and in Europe because the question earlier alluded to um, decriminalisation or legalisation of recreational use of cannabis in Europe. Um, in the UK, that is highly unlikely to happen. However, in terms of approach to cannabinoids as food ingredients, currently the European Union are saying absolutely not. We are not prepared to assess them because we consider that they may well be narcotics. Whereas the UK takes a completely different view and says, no, they're not a narcotic. CBD is not a narcotic. It can be a food and we're more than happy to treat it as such. So one can see that they're almost traveling in opposite directions, that in Europe, there's, there's an appetite for legalization for recreational use, including controlled cannabinoids, but no appetite in respect of it as a, a use in food. Whereas in the UK, the idea that it will be, cannabis will be legalized is many, many years away. However, immediately now, the government are more than happy to allow CBD products to be manufactured and sold to its population which is why it's the, the largest um, market in Europe and why when faced with the issue of we are leaving the European Union, do we keep the same rules that they have and the same approach that the European member states have and the Commission has, or are we prepared to branch out on our own? And CBD is an example and cannabinoids that don't control controlled um, narcotic cannabinoids, uh, an example of where the UK government took the decision to say, we are happy to have this industry. We are happy to have products manufactured here and we are happy to have products sold to our population as long as they can be shown to be safe as a food. Um, sure. in, the, in, that, in that context, the UK truly is open for business in the cannabinoid sector, whereas at Europe at the minute, the drawbridge is pulled up and the door is firmly closed. Great, thank you so much because that actually touched in on the last point we wanted to bring up was the uh, impact of Brexit. And basically you answered the question that was proposed to us um, in regards to uh, how you drew on the um, complications and the uh, contradictions between the EU and the UK, uh, for example, CBD and, and et cetera. However, we've got to move on to our next speaker. We really appreciate your presentation, gentlemen. And we look forward to hearing more from you in our discussion panel uh, later this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.